presenting the Army's new Ascender plane. With its elevator controls in the nose and its motor and propeller in the rear, this push-propelled fighter reverses conventional airplane design. Developed experimentally as the XP-55, the new plane gives forward vision for the pilot and a clear path for his gunfire. In action, the darting tail-first ascender seems to fly backwards. At Santo Toma prison in Manila, a surprise visit by General MacArthur marks the greatest mass liberation of civilians in the Pacific. 3,700 internees, mostly British and American citizens, are free. But even as they rejoice, there is a final burst of fire from the retreating enemy. American artillery answers back. Safe at last, the internees gather for evacuation back home. Pitifully undernourished, they can still chop wood to cook their new army rations. News from home after three long years. The Red Cross distributes letters from loved ones these internees had thought they might never hear from again. MacArthur, leaving Santo Toma, is hailed by the liberated prisoners who have found freedom after years of suffering under the Japanese. State Secretary of State Statinius arrives in Mexico City and joins Assistant Secretary Nelson Rockefeller in attending the Inter-American Conference at Mexico's historic Chapultepec Palace. The heads of the United States delegation are welcomed at the Mexican Chamber of Deputies as this important New World meeting opens. Inter-American economic and cultural relations within the framework of the World Security Organization to be set up in San Francisco take first place in the Mexico City discussion. Host to the statesmen of the Americas is Mexican President Manuel Avila Camacho, who arrives to greet the delegates and inaugurate the conference. President Avila Camacho is Mexico's Foreign Minister Padilla. The Conference of the Americas is formally open. Driving toward Colmar and Alsace are French army troops, veterans of African warfare. Now in stiff street fighting, they advance past the dead. French Red Cross women are with them. One is wounded. Here is the first French tank to enter Colmar. Here again is liberation. Here, happy people. Here again, bread. Further north on the Western Front, American troops fight their way forward.
Because of the rough terrain, mules have been brought up from Italy. Here, combat goes on in the heaviest snow in 80 years. While the infantry advances, 4.2 mortars fire over their heads. This is the start of one of the great barrages. Up forward, artillery is called for. The order goes through underground headquarters and back to the guns. Prisoners come in, hungry, cold, and tired to the point of exhaustion. Some drag their wounded in on sleds. For others, there is no need. The Allies attack all along the Western Front through the dragon's teeth of the Siegfried Line in an advance which takes them to the Rhine. Capital in Washington, President Roosevelt arrives to report to Congress. Members of the Cabinet and Supreme Court attend the special joint session. The President is seated in the well of the House. Home from the Crimea Conference, he asks nonpartisan support for the agreements reached there. It's been a long journey, but I hope you'll also agree that it has been, so far, a fruitful one. Speaking in all frankness, the question of whether it is entirely fruitful or not lies to a great extent in your hands. For unless you are here, you here in the hall of the American Congress, with the support of the American people, concur in the general conclusions reached at a place called Yalta, and give them your active support the meeting will not have produced lasting results. There were two main purposes in this Crimea conference. The first was to bring defeat to Germany with the greatest possible speed, with the smallest possible loss of allied men. The second purpose was to continue to build the foundation for an international accord that would bring order and security after the chaos of the war. It would give some assurance of lasting peace among nations of the world. The conference in the Crimea was a turning point, I hope, in our history, and therefore in the history of the world. It will soon be presented to the Senate and the American people a great decision that will determine the fate of the United States, and I think, therefore, the fate of the world, for generations to come, there can be no middle ground here. We shall have to take the responsibility for world collaboration, or we shall have to bear the responsibility for another world conflict. And I am confident that the Congress and the American people will accept the results of this conference as the beginnings of a permanent structure of peace, upon which we can begin to build under God, that better world in which our children and grandchildren, yours and mine, the children and grandchildren of the whole world must live and can live.